extensive, yeah. All right, so with that, I don't know if I just found the memo or the actual report. The document I just found by Google was a memo. It's 20 pages. Do you want- Yeah, me? that's that's it, Christine. Oh, okay, I'll send it out. Perfect. Okay, just give me a second. I have to just get, okay. I'm sending it out now. Hi, Commissioner. Good morning, Councilor. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Did you, you guys were just going to answer questions and talk about progress, or did you have a presentation? You didn't have it, right? Uh, no, there's no presentation. Um, Excellent. Okay. A, a brief opening remark, and then we just want to restart the conversation and uh, move it forward. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Morning, Councilor Braden. Good morning, Councilor Edwards. How are you? Well, thank you. Whew. I'm gonna give a couple more minutes for maybe go start at 10.05 to give some of the colleagues to sign on. Fine, no trouble. It's a beautiful morning out there. Yeah. Hi, Chris and John. How are you? 
Good morning, Counselor. Good morning. Um, hi, I, I take it you guys again, no presentation, just here to answer questions and okay. progress, things like that. Yep. Okay, excellent, excellent. We'll just give it till about 10.05 and then we'll start.
All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we got a lot of work before us. So <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I'm City Council Lydia Edwards, Chair of the, Gov of the Committee on Government Operations. It's Tuesday, July 14th, and we are here today, excuse me, sorry, my head. <laughs> it is Thursday, July 16th, uh, 20, uh, 2020, and we're here today for a virtual working session on docket uh, 03, oh, Sorry, I opened up the wrong opening statements. Sorry, Christine, I apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying my best, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Open up the wrong ones. That's what I get for having two working sessions on major stuff in the same. <laughs> do you have, do you have Yeah, them? no, I do have them. Okay. <laughs> I apologize to everyone. I, am, I wish I'd memorized the opening statement and all the other stuff, but I, I have not been good at that. One second. Do, do, do. Did everyone get the Sullivan and Worcester report though in the meantime? Got it. Okay. Um, that was not included in the original documents, but I feel if we're gonna refer to it, uh, we should have that. All right, second take. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Council Lydia Edwards. This, I'm the Chair of Government of the Committee on Government Ops. Today is Thursday, July 16th, and we're here today for a virtual working session on Docket 0233, Petition for a Special Law regarding an act relative to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm the sponsor of this docket and was referred to the committee on January 29, 2020. The committee held a hearing on this matter on February 25th. In accordance with Governor Baker's uh, executive order from March 12th, we're modifying the requirements for open meeting law and therefore we're having this working session virtually via Zoom. This enables us to continue our, out our responsibilities while adhering to public health accommodations. Um, you can, the public may watch this meeting via live stream via www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Will also be rebroadcasted at a later date on Comcast 8 slash RCN 82 slash Verizon 1964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.go at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. So I am going to stop there very quickly and acknowledge my colleagues who are here and also just briefly describe how we're going to approach today. Um, the first, we've been joined by my colleagues, Councilor Liz, uh, in the order of their arrival, Councilor Ed Flynn, Councilor Michelle Wu, and Councilor Liz Braden. Is Ed still here? And, um, and so we will approach this, allowing my colleagues uh, to have any opening brief remarks, but this is a working session. And so we're gonna get to the work of that. And the goal is to get a home rule petition, or at least as much comments about the home rule, the legal, language that we'd like to send to the state house, uh, certified and finished. But also because of the uh, the process that we're in, we did have a hearing, we did have a um, an executive order was released by the mayor as well that took, I would say honestly, took a lot of the uh, practical suggestions in the home rule position, uh, home rule petition to heart and responded accordingly. So there are certain things that have already been acted upon or being acted on by the city. Um, and I wanna thank the administration for doing that and just taking the leadership. And we were, myself and Liz Braden were actually at the signing of that executive order. So we will get an update after we discuss the legal components. Um, we have a comparison chart between the home rule and the executive order and what's left for us to deal with. So that's what we'll be discussing. And then we'll go into the uh, executive order updates and concerns and what's going on, what's not going on. There were a lot of things happening. Um, and also we'll deal with questions asked at the previous hearing. I have minutes from that um, to also have the administration um, deal with that. But I think it's very important um, that we have real comments on the final product that are that is going to come out of this working session um, because of the deadline at the state house. I intend to have this voted on on July 29th at our next city council hearing. So I will now turn it over to my colleagues for any, any opening remarks that they may have a brief again, so that we can get to um, uh, the, the substance of the matter. So Councillor, Councillor Flynn, if you're still with us. Oh, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, the only comments I have, I'll, I'll be very brief. I just wanna say thank you for the administration staff for being here. I know there's been great progress on this issue. 
want to say want to say thank you to the um, mayor's team. I want to say thank you to my colleagues at the city council and central staff as well for working on this important issue. And I'm looking forward to this discussion and learning more about it. Thank you, Council Edwards, for your leadership. Thank you, Councilor uh, Wu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I really don't have much for an opening statement. I'll just wait for my turn for questions. Thank you. Absolutely. And then Councillor Braden. Uh, ditto, uh, Councillor Wu. I will just uh, hold my questions later. Thank you so much for all, all involved. Um, this is a really important piece of um, legislation to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for, for folks at home, um, representing the administration today is Commissioner Dion Irish from ISD. We have uh, Chris English also from ISD. No, I apologize, Chris. Um, yeah, no, he is. Um, I am at ISD now, Councilor. Okay, okay. yes, yeah. so you are at ISD. My apologies. We have Katie John, John Towell. Um, uh, and we also have Attorney Edward Coburn. Did I get everybody? I hope so. Okay. And they'll be answering a lot of the questions that we have today. So before we get into it, I wanted to, to, to bring us back to how, how much work has actually been going on and also just summarize some of the questions my colleagues had at the previous uh, working, or excuse me, previous hearing. Um, a lot of the questions were around the process, specifically around translation. I think Ed, uh, Councillor Flynn specifically was curious about the uh, transparency, the process, being notified, and also making sure it's in more than one language. Uh, Councillor uh, Flaherty was talking a great deal about the zoning, the, the buffer zones, and whether there was room for changing those to make them bigger. Uh, Councillor Arroyo specifically was, were, uh, was talking about, again, the notice requirements for the, uh, for the, for the process and for the hearings, um, not only just language, but timing. Uh, my, I specifically asked about the, the, the frequency of the meetings. In many cases, I felt that having 100 cases was not a sufficient, nor was it truly a deliberative process and that we needed to consider weekly meetings um, for the ZBA. Uh, Councillor Wu was specifically concerned about um, the, how a project is or isn't included on the timeline, what decisions are made for deferral, what decisions and how they're made for the extension. Also, uh, I don't know that we got a uh, complete conversation about the audit report that was put out um, specifically from the city. And I'll let Councillor Wu uh, continue that questioning today. Um, and then, sorry, that was Councillor um, Councilor Baker specifically asked about the timing and how much time ZBA members have to even deliberate or think about the projects. Um, and, there were just several, and Councilor, Councilor Braden was also concerned about uh, the standards for the variants, how, why there are so many given out, um, and also was upon the, um, the vein of having some sort of transparency about how many per neighborhood were given out uh, so that we're very clear about that. And that's something I did ask for in the, um, in the home rule petition. Uh, so if I mischaracterize any of your questioning, uh, colleagues who are on the, on the, the, on the Zoom, please feel free to, to supplement. But I wanted to make sure that we continued our conversation. I believe Councillor Asabi George is also trying to sign in. Let me just make sure. Um, there we go. Councillor Asabi George. Morning, thank you very much. Um, I'm here now and looking forward to the rest of today's discussion. Thank you very much, Councillor George. So. In short, those are the summary of the, our process thus far, our questions thus far, and also um, where we are in terms of trying to get this home rule done and voted on in the next week. Um, does anyone specifically from the administration or from my colleagues looking at the home rule petition now, looking at the language in the home rule petition, have any questions or concerns Actually, let me re rephrase that. I want to be more direct. Let's go to the comparison document. That will actually help guide this. Everyone should have a copy of the comparison document between the home rule petition as proposed and the executive order, which took care of a lot of things. And also there are certain things that are just not able to 
be taken care of in an executive order. Does everyone have that? Councilor Sabi George, did you get a copy? Um, thank you, Councilor Edwards. I'm looking for it now. Okay. I'll just let everyone pull that up. In the meantime, I understand, um, Councilor Wu, you may have some time limits. I didn't know if you wanted to go ahead and put some questions out now or before we go into the comparison. Um, I think you go ahead with the comparison and I'll, well. I'll wait because it's not directly related to that. So I don't want to derail the conversation. Very well. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Um, so now we're dealing again, we have a home rule petition and executive order. And a lot of the things in the home rule petition was taken care of in the executive order or at least addressed in the executive order. And we'll get to the updates on those. So the major, if you'll look at it, the first thing, oh, we've also been joined by Councilor Flaherty. Good morning, Madam Chair. Technical difficulties over the last 10, 15 minutes. Sorry, I'm joining a little late. Councilor Flaherty? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. It came in pretty, pretty awful, but you sound okay now. Councilor Flaherty, Thank you we're on. Um, Thanks, Madam Chair. Sorry for joining late. We are. Um, we're focused on uh, the uh, the comparison document that was sent out earlier between the home rule and the executive order. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Very well. So we pull all that. Okay. So the major difference between the executive order and the legislation is that the legislation intends to add additional seats or change the comp. The, the the members of the ZBA. That can only be done by the home rule petition. It cannot be done by executive order. We've also been joined by Councillor Bach. Sorry, making sure she's in. Very well. Uh, Flaherty and Bach. So that that is no real, um, there's no difference in the executive order or in the home rule petition about that. Um, as many will recall, uh, the home rule petition looks at expertise in the environmental and city planning, having a tenant perspective, having someone knowledgeable in zoning laws and having all of that available. The executive order does not and cannot propose new seats, but does support board training on a regular basis um, so that the board members are brought up I think it's on a quarterly basis, brought up to speed on all the zoning changes in the neighborhood and understanding what they mean. That was prompted by the confusion about the buffer zone between uh, marijuana dispensaries. That was uh, brought up because there was confusion about whether a neighborhood is in or out of the iPod and making sure there was comprehensive continued education. The next component was about electronic filing, electronic records and electronic notice. We both, I proposed in the legislation and administration responded by essentially adopting most of the recommendations and providing a timeline to implement them. Being able to file online, records being able to be um, searchable online and allowing people in the neighborhood to find by their neighborhood what's being put up. Uh, being able to sign up to receive electronic emails and notifications about a specific project. Uh, most important is when it's being deferred so that you don't show up and take time off of work um, and then find out that the project has been moved. And also know when the deferral date is coming up. And then also for ZBA members to receive information the day uh, before the day of the hearing. These were, I believe, all adopted in the executive order. Um, what wasn't, um, but I still propose and think is, I would like the administration to answer eventually is about the quarterly reports on variances. I think myself and, and Councilor Braden were concerned about having a, an understanding comprehensively of how we are giving out neighborhood uh, variances, what kinds of variances down to the neighborhood le level. We want, and I still want um, the, the administration um, to commit to that. It's in the home rule petition if, if, you, if you won't, but I do think it's, it makes sense. It, we should know what's going on. And also it helps to know if it's just FIR versus height. And if we're gonna look at zoning going on. Financial disclosure, one of the biggest concerns in the home rule was conflicts of interest, financial interest being involved, and that the, um, 
so I required initially that the board, um, anybody coming before the board would actually make a public um, statement of interest explaining their ownership interests, especially for the many people who come under the shield of an LLC or under the shield of a corporation. We wanted to be very clear about who is actually buying and getting the variances in our neighborhoods. Um, the executive order responds um, by uh, requiring board members, which I hadn't thought about, actually to do statements of financial interest, which I think was great, but also directs the city uh, to change the zoning uh, code standard for thresholds uh, for applicants. Right now, if you're under Article 80 and you're a large project person, you are required to already give this information to the city. And the city is gonna lower that threshold so that folks um, who are coming before the ZBA that aren't large projects will be giving out this information. Um, mine was a blanket for anybody. Um, there was a concern about how that, you know, the average homeowner putting a dormer on their house shouldn't be included in that. And so um, we, I think the city put in a limit of at least $10,000 being earned on the project. That's a difference. Um, additional conflicts of interest. Um, my legislation removes the conflicted priorities, uh, removing essentially real estate interests um, from the board. I also wanted a, a geographic ban for anyone currently serving on the board. You couldn't be in the business of architect or being in the business of real estate in the city of Boston. Uh, I also wanted a five-year cooling off period <laughs> so that if you, were, if you uh, were done with the board, you did it five years before you could get back into the industry or vice versa. And it applies um, conflicts of interest also to board, board staff. The executive order does respond and does come up with a conflict of interest. Um, it expands restrictions on the board participation and appeals on former business interests from two to five years. So adopting the five years, but not the geographic ban um, and does do a two year cooling off period for any bills, business dealings with an adjudicated project following the vote date. So if I voted on my 186 London um, Shire Street in East Boston, on June 1st, 2020, I couldn't deal with and work even in my private industry on that project for two years. So that's my interpretation. Um, I believe that's what the administration intended is to stay away from projects I vote for for at least two years. So there is no, I made it rich. I voted on this awesome project. Bam, I'm gonna turn around the next week, quit the board and then work on there as a consultant. Am I correct? Very well. So that, so we, I will say um, many of the concerns were responded to. Um, one concern I had was the standard of a variance. The executive order does not approach that because the executive order cannot. Um, I wanted to actually make the executive order part of the zoning code. And I wanted to change it to at least allow for consideration of several things, impact on the city's goals for generating income, restricted housing, furthering for housing, preventing eviction and displacement, and addressing climate change. At least have these things be asked and be part of the consideration. The executive order does not address that. The set seven save the zoning laws. Okay. Then then st staff support, accessibility, customer facing reforms also suggested in the legislation. I wanted to create a community council someone who's neutral, who could uh, be there to help guide people through what many consider a very intimidating, unfriendly process. If you're not in the know, if you're just here having an opinion, um, the uh, executive order responded with an ombudsman position, which is essentially not an, an outright attorney, but someone who is there, who is supposed to help guide neutrally both parties or any party who needs some help. This is where you speak. This is the number that you have. This is what happens if you don't win today. This is what happens if you do win today. This is the proceeding process. And we wanted to make sure that that was also part available in many languages. Um, ZBA training and internal policies, both the uh, home rule and the executive order require the board to promulgate some rules. And the legislation, the mayor and the director of the BRA would be responsible for updating the ZBA on changes to city ordinances and uh, 
and zoning and the executive or order in response to that, they basically said, um, we'll hold, there'll be trainings on a regular basis and would hold meetings on rules within 120 days, which we can talk about those dates, whether the, 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 the rules actually happen on February 24th, 2020, and or June 23rd, 2020. But essentially, we should get some updates on what the training schedule looks like now. Other administrative policy legislative changes, the frequency of meetings, I brought that up, that's still a concern. There's clearly too many, too many on one day. Um, standards for directing um, projects to the evening or homeowner in evening meetings, what's happening with the small project review, if you will, on Thursdays. Um, the staffing budgetary request to support this for ISD. Uh, the data reporting. And also term limits was something I brought up as well. Since you are appointing them, I maybe the council towel or someone or counselor uh, Ed, Edward, um, Edward Colburn could speak to whether it's it, whether we need a um, term limits in the home rule or whether you can do so outright in the executive order or the city could do this. My understanding is a term is three years. And I, I think, and my colleagues can agree, disagree that two terms is sufficient. That's six years being in, be able to impact the variances in the city of Boston. Definitely no more than three terms, which would be nine years. So that's the presentation of the comparison of the two. Major things still left for the home rule. Who should be on the ZBA? The standard for a variance. Those are the big ones for the for the uh, executive order. Excuse me for the home home rule petition. I will now turn it over to um, if the administration has any summary or some questions. But I I will likely turn it over to my colleagues who may have many questions because that was a lot of information. I'd like to say a few words. So thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to all the other members of the council. We're um, gracious for this opportunity to um, recontinue this conversation. As you mentioned, we last um, spoke about this, I think February 25th. And um, as you also stated that this is something that the mayor is committed to, not just in words, but in action. And, and that's why we, the mayor has issued an executive order that addresses many of the things that, that we're trying to be accomplished uh, through the home rule petition. So the commitment is there on uh, board composition is something that we need to continue to talk about. And we are prepared to do that today. But we are in agreement on, on disclosures, transparency, training, modernizing the board, reporting. Uh, I can answer that question now. Yes, we are committed to, to doing quarterly reports and even on an ongoing basis to provide um, open data in addition to, um, to better um, you know, database that folks can access for ZBA cases. So the commitment is there. We're here prepared today to, um, to work. This is a working session. Uh, I know that there are a lot of questions that, um, that we actually um, weren't really prepared for. We are understanding that today we're working on moving forward to some legislation that we could um, get agreement on and move up to the state house. But we, um, we're prepared to give an update on where we are with the executive order uh, implementation. And I think it may be helpful just to get that out the way so that we can spend time on, on things that we need to really to get some agreement on so we can um, we can advance our goals here today. Um, and to do that. we'll also uh, answer as many questions as we can, but just want to, to bring that context and understanding that um, that that um, it's been a, a while since we had this conversation and a lot has happened and a lot occurs on a regular basis. But um, with that said, if, if it's OK, I would like to um, ask Chris English, who is now chief of staff at ISD, to just give an update on where we are with the executive order implementation. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilors. Um, just for the items that we uh, put in the executive order that had um, you know, a time limit on when we needed to implement them by, uh, they're sort of broken down into four buckets. Um, mm -hmm. So the first bucket would be uh, the 120 day requirements. So this would be translation and language access, as well as mm -hmm. the appointing of a ZBA uh, ombuds person. Uh, so right now, uh, the translation and the language access, I think we had a, a somewhat easier time uh, adopting that, given that we've moved to virtual hearings during the uh, 
response to the pandemic. So uh, right now uh, for all hearings, we provide the opportunity for folks that need translation assistance, uh, whether that's to provide testimony or to just understand uh, what's going on with the board or to actually provide a presentation to notify the department uh, in advance that they would need translation assistance. And then we will provide that during the hearings. Um, so that that's provided in all of the notices that we send out uh, to abutters to that we post online. Um, so that that's available and uh, we're working on expanding that capability through our digital platform to provide real time translation. Uh, so that's something in addition that we're, we're looking to do. But right now, if, if somebody does need some assistance with translation, we're able to provide. Uh, as far as the, the ambassador position is, is sort of what we're referring to it as. We have appointed somebody as a ZBA ambassador that's there uh, at least an hour beforehand on hearing days to answer questions uh, that folks might have about you know, how to testify or when something's coming up on an agenda or how to access information about board proceedings. Uh, that ambassador person is also there throughout the entire hearing uh, to answer questions, to help facilitate testimony from the public as well as uh, presenters. Uh, and they're available you know, throughout the week um, before and after hearings as well. So that, that's both of those items. I think we, we've accomplished sort of what has been contemplated in the executive order and we're looking to expand those capabilities beyond. Um, the next sort of time item is uh, scheduling a, a business meeting with the board to discuss written policies and procedures. Um, that was due on the 22nd of June. Uh, we held a, a meeting with the board, um, a public meeting to discuss a written policy and procedure document uh, June 16th, uh, solicited input from the public as well as board members were working on updating that to incorporate the feedback that we've gotten uh, with the goal of having that voted on and adopted mm -hmm. formally by the board uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, our next deadlines are uh, coming up next month uh, this would be primarily technology related. So uh, the online application and payment for uh, appeals, uh, the application itself has been uh, developed. The technology is there. We're beta testing it right now, but both the payment and the applications are ready, given uh, ready to roll out as soon as uh, we confirm that all the capabilities work for uh, just the, the technology side of it. Electronic testimony is something we've also adopted. Um, this is both written, it's uh, provided, you know, sort of by default through our virtual hearings. Um, all of that testimony is, you know, what we would consider electronic, but we provide folks the opportunity to send in written or taped uh, testimony in advance of hearings, and those are read into the record when a case comes up before the board. So um, the electronic testimony is available. Uh, we also have uh, a few weeks left before we petition uh, the zoning commission on changing the thresholds for reporting. Uh, I think we're working with the BPDA on that as we speak and our goal is to have that done before uh, mid August. Uh, finally, our 18 month uh, turnaround, our electronic plans, electronic notice and a comprehensive ZBA database. So uh, we, the city uh, in general is in the process of uh, developing a, a enterprise level e-plan solution. So not only for ISD, but for departments across um, the city that use plan review. Uh, we are on track to have that developed and implemented before next year. So, um, Moving that right along, electronic notice is uh, something that we're doing now, um, in addition to uh, paper notices that are sent out that, that are mailed. Um, but we're also expanding uh, the information that we're putting up online uh, as far as notices and data. So we have a fellow working from Do It this summer on our ZBA data, uh, cleaning up things and getting ready to put a project tracking system online available for constituents and applicants, <laughs> uh, similar to what you find with the BPDA board. 
where you have project information, various steps uh, in the process that it's at, uh, opportunities to submit comments. Our goal is to have something similar um, for the ZDA. While it's, it's a much larger universe of cases, we think we can accomplish that pretty uh, comprehensively, mm -hmm. I'd say. We are in the process of hiring additional staff that were approved in the FY21 budget for the ZBA. So some clerk positions and an additional paralegal. We're also- uh, Sorry to interrupt. Um, Councilor Flaherty, I note your hand is raised. We are gonna go through questions um, in order of arrival right after he's, he's finished. Okay. Continue, I'm sorry. Uh, and we're also uh, in the process of bringing on some additional management analysts for ISD's internal IT team uh, to work on uh, CBA technology related stuff. So uh, I think we're on the right track. Uh, we're cutting down a lot of the, uh, the items that were in the executive order uh, and we should, we're on track to complete all of these by the various deadlines that are put in there, so. Very well. I just wanna just add one more thing to, to what Chris just said, just to expand a little bit more on what we're doing for hearings. Currently, we are having weekly hearings with an agenda that, that provides more time for deliberation. I think they've been going well and getting better week by week. Um, we are planning to go back to our regular schedule of having um, every other, you know, every other week, but we're still a, an agenda that's much lighter than what we had before. But we also plan to add an additional hearing per quarter. The thanks for, for approving the uh, budget. There are new staff members um, dedicated in that budget. We expect to have bodies in those positions, actually, maybe by September. And when we have sufficient staffing, then we do plan to going forward, look at going back to a weekly schedule that would be more easily accomplished with, with um, the additional staff than it is to sustain right now. Um, so I just wanted to give an update on that as well. Very well. Um, just some quick questions then from me and then I will go in order of arrival. Um, the, the translation assistance, how do people know to sign up for that? Right now it's uh, on the notices that are mailed out to abutters as well as the notice that's posted online for the hearing. So in, it includes a phone number, an email address and a web link that someone could use to sign up for the translation assistance. Very well. And then you noted that there are the rules and regulations or standards uh, from the board will be voted on by the board. Were they ever made available for public comment or at least consideration? They were in advance of the hearing on the 16th. On the 16th, okay. Um, can you work with Christine to coordinate that for all of the colleagues who may not have seen them, including myself? Certainly. Thank you. In terms of the staff member who's the ombuds person, is this a regular like full-time staff person dedicated to this job or is this kind of a rotating in person from, from ISD? So it's a full-time ISD staffer, but it's the right now it's the assistant commissioner for constituent services. Is that Ms. Johnson? Aisha, yes. Wonderful, Ms. wonderful. Ms. Miller, no. I'm sorry? Uh, her, her name is Ms. I call Miller. her Ms. Johnson. You can call her, <laughs> <laughs> I call her Ms. Johnson. Um, so just, just to be clear on that, um, the, the difference, I mean, I appreciate responding to the uh, home rule petition, but the way, the way I saw the home rule and the way I saw that position was someone who is there, uh, that's their kind of their job and maybe maybe it's not a big enough job, but who is, uh, and, and is consistently there. Will, will some of you be replacing Aisha? Is it going to be Aisha's, or Ms. Johnson's number one? I'm, I'm concerned about con continuity of standards, a continuity of friendliness, continuity of understanding the process. And so how do you assure that the person who is in that, behind that desk, who is there, is meeting this same kind of standards, understands that the entire goal is about, you know, neutrality. How do you do that if you're, if you are rotating people in? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we don't envision that uh, Ms. Miller will be doing this in perpetuity, but we do understand that even though there, there is um, positions budgeted in our new uh, budget, that it'll take us some time to actually hire those people. So when we do have additional staff, which we expect to, to do so by September, we'll mm -hmm. be able to use our, our regular staff that it, it may still not be one person, but it will be a small team that would be uh, in part of that rotation. And just to be clear, this person is not unlike with you know ONS who is there, who is who is representing the administration, and that's fine. This person's job is not to admit be the representative of the administration. They are supposed to be the representative of the process. Exactly, that's correct. 
that that means a lot to me. Um, the annual report financial disclosures, when is the ZBA members going to start to do that? That's also part of the executive order. I don't have a date for you right now, um, but I'm happy to follow up with you on that. I know that we had to do ours this year in June. Um, our, our, I, I think that we should have a date for when the financial disclosures are done. See, uh, typically it is June for, for, for myself as well. So I envision it'll be June as well for GBA members. Well, so we'll just get back to, be, to you on that. Just to push back, you know, this executive order was done in February. So this June should have been when they got or done or something, some sort of financial disclosure. So I think this year. I, I, no, I understand, but a, a few weeks after the executive order, we, we did shut down for the pandemic. I'm sorry, but it's true. I have to, to mm -hmm. share that. And so we actually paused ZBA and we were focused on critical services and, and now we're resuming and we're recovering. And so I, I would have to say that 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 did affect that timeline. Understood. Um, I understood. I'm not. I'm not denying that. Uh, can I get a commitment that it will be done this year and then absolutely yes and then going forward every June? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, you noted that you were going to file the the required zoning language to lower the threshold. Um, my understanding is by mid August. You said you're filing that with the zoning commission. That's the goal. Yes. Okay. And we will have an opportunity to commit or comment on that as well, because that'll be part of a different public process. Of course. Okay. Um, the electronic notice. So if I am going to direct a butter to whatever, I'm going to get in my notice physically in my house, a something that says I can sign up for translation and something that on the same notice, something that says I can sign up for electronic like updates as well. Am I correct? Right. So right now it's in the notices, hard copy mailed to abutters, but it's also posted online, but it has the uh, information on where to sign up to testify, uh, a phone number and an email address that are dedicated to answering questions about the board or specific cases. Uh, and the goal moving forward is to have these, an email subscription type system where you can sign up directly online for either a particular case, cases across a certain neighborhood or citywide cases moving forward. So you get email notification of those. So in addition to being an abutter to a particular project, we'll expand the ability to, to get notified of hearings moving forward. Uh, I think that's great. Um, and then the quarterly reports of the variances given out. I don't think the executive order address that I understood, uh, Commissioner Irish, that's something that you guys are not opposed to, or maybe I'm incorrect, but I think there should be an annual assessment of what's happening in terms of the variances. Yeah, we, 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 that's not something we're opposed to. As Chris mentioned, we, we do have a, um, a, 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 a summer fellow actually from uh, the Department of Innovation and Technology who's working with us on ZBA data. We should have a, uh, a, a report from them in about a month and we can, from there, we can provide a timeline as to what, what the dates are. But we're, we're certainly supportive of not only of um, providing quarterly reports, we want mm -hmm. the data to be available on an ongoing basis. I Okay, I appreciate that. Those are my questions. Councilor Flynn said he's okay. <laughs> Going to confirm with that. Yep, still good, Councilor Flynn? He may have gone. Uh, Councilor Wu? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate everyone's time and um, appreciate your leadership, Councilor Edwards, for uh, continuing this. We are now, I think, five months from the last hearing or the last working session on this. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on a few things asked last time to see if there are more answers, um, but also just start with the kind of state of the, the current ZBA um, membership now. So could could someone, and maybe it's Commissioner Irish, um, just tell us the names of the current board members and which of the pathways towards appointment that they represent? You're muted, Commissioner. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm going to come slow. I'm going to ask Chris um, English, Chief of Staff, to just to provide that information, please. Did you hear me? Hello? Yep, I was just um, pulling up the names here. Sorry. Um, right now, uh, we currently have Mark Ehrlich, who is appointed through the Building Trades Council. We have Mark Fortune. Uh, he's through the Building Trades Employers Association. We have Christina Rougeau, who's a mayoral appointee. We have Joe Ruggiero, who's also a mayoral appointee on behalf of a neighborhood organization. We have Tyrone Kendall, who is an alternate member uh, appointed through the Boston Building Trades Council. We have um, Carrie Walsh, who is an alternate. Uh, sorry, that's a, a filed appointment. Uh, Ed DeVoe, who's uh, an active alternate member from the Greater Boston Real Estate Board. So those are our active members. Uh, and then there are several that are in process. Um, and what about Nadine? Nadine is no longer a member of the board. Okay, so I'm just cross-referencing this with the um, the public website. Okay, so we've had Mark, Christine, Mark, Carrie, Tyrone, Ed DeVoe, Joe Ruggiero, Nadine. Okay, so that means, so could you just um, verify that's one, two, three, four active members and two active alternates? Is that correct? That's correct. And could you just remind everyone um, what the procedures are in terms of quorum and when can, you know, when we're at quorum or below quorum, what can happen in terms of the petitioner's ability to defer, et cetera? Certainly. So uh, we need five members for a quorum uh, and you need at least five votes uh, to approve a, docu a, a case moving forward. So um, if there are only six members seated, um, it requires nearly a unanimous vote for something to get passed. So members, uh, applicants may request a deferral um, if there are not a fully seated board. Does that answer your question? Um, fully seated meaning for that meeting or in general? For that meeting, okay. Uh, okay. but right now it, it's in general since there are only technically six uh, board members. Um. Wait, could you go over that six again, Chris? I'm so sorry, I had five on my list. Can you just say the names one more time? I just wanna be 100% clear. Sure, uh, Mark Ehrlich, mm -hmm. Mark Fortune, Christina mm -hmm. Ruggio, mm -hmm. Joe Ruggiero, Tyrone mm -hmm. Kendall, and Ed DeVoe. Oh, okay, so you're basically saying that the alternates are already bumped up, um, effectively bumped up to full members because of the, the um, shortage. Right, exactly. Okay, and then just in terms of the, um, you know, and I had Commissioner Irish and I had a conversation about this leading up to the budget vote in terms of the the sort of backup that this might create and, and the impact on um, cases. So when, you know, when petitioners are re requesting deferrals, et cetera, um, that just means that later council, I'm oh, sorry, ZBA meetings get, the agenda just gets longer and longer. Um, and then just to clarify, so the city council has in the planning development and transportation committee, um, I believe it is, uh, let me just double check the docket numbers. Um, I believe it is five dockets for consideration and potential confirmation. Yeah, I believe there are four who are waiting confirmation. Four, uh, waiting. one, okay. Eric Robinson, Constantinos Ligris, uh, Kerry Walsh Logue, and Tim Burke. Okay, so one person has withdrawn then? Because there's a, there's an additional docket that is still live that was filed in October of 2019. Um, but my understanding is that that person is no longer interested. So that person is still interested. Oh, okay. Ms. Beha? No, we have, I have another person here from um, October 2019, um, Timothy Burke. Okay, we have another, um, uh, there was another uh, request for confirmation from that date also from someone that was not just listed. Okay, so it, it is four. Okay. Not five. Okay, um, and so, you know, I just want to be clear on my part that as chair of that committee, I 
full, you know, wholeheartedly agree with the push that Councilor Edwards is making now to, to look at the structure of the board and how that influences business, particularly because of the relationships that we have seen play out uh, with the federal investigation and subsequent ones, um, but that we are a little bit uh, caught in a situation where I believe, you know, I think there's questions that have been unanswered. I'm happy to go back through some of them. If, if it's easier, I'm happy to put it in writing and, and submit it um, as the council moves towards consideration to help relieve this um, stressful situation that the board members are under of, of being right at quorum and, and, and sometimes below. Um, so I know we discussed a little bit about the executive order and its implementation. Could, you, could we just review very quickly the Sullivan and Worcester reports recommendations, there were 42 of them in the appendix, and which, how many and which of those have been implemented? So I, I need to go through them one by one, right? Is that okay? And Councillor Wu? Um, just for time purposes, if we maybe, I don't know if you have a specific question about them, I'm happy to come back on the, the Sullivan Worcester report, but I did want to get to other folks' questions about the executive order versus the, the home rule. Happy to come back to this, though, or happy. Uh, you know, if over the next um, person's questions, it, you know, Counts Commissioner Irish wants to make a count or something like that, we don't have to do it sort of live in the moment, but I would like to know which of the 42 recommendations have been implemented. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll Absolutely. Have report on that. It actually would be easier if we could just go through this afterwards and provide a report. Otherwise, I'd need to go through this in real time and, um, and give you an answer. Okay. I just, I mean, I want to note that I had asked a series of questions five months ago at our hearing and did not receive any follow-up on any of those answers. And so now I'm looking to have to follow up on those. So I just, um, I would love that. I, I would have appreciate that very much, but um, it feels that like we're asking the same questions over and over again to no avail. Um, Councillor, to, to hopefully to find a balanced approach to this uh, issue and quandary, uh, as we're going through the additional um, council members kind of questions, I do think it's worth uh, somebody from the administration at least going through and at least marking up some of the 42 things that you've acted on or have not acted on while we're doing some questions there's there's you know four of you guys on today i'm sure someone can take the time to go through that while we're asking other questions thank you madam chair that would be wonderful thank you and so just to continue on with the, the question so again i'm asking the administration while we're dealing with this and three can answer the questions and somebody can go through that report um we will come back for a second round and, and hopefully by then counts uh, we'll have some updates Councillor brayden I don't have any further questions at this moment. Thank you. Very well. Councillor Sabi George. Sorry, I slowed to the button there. Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just sort of my long standing issue is making sure that uh, when a matter is deferred, that the, uh, the abutters uh, and the local neighborhood association uh, receive additional notice uh, that's always been uh, this that was this this is really an issue from the previous administration um, and the roost that they used to run with deferrals so uh, my hope is that um, when a matter is deferred the onus really should be on the petitioner and it should be at their cost because they're they're making that decision to defer their matter um, the onus should now be on them to take the affirmative steps to notify particularly the direct about is if not by certified mail uh, by old school going out there and leafleting the neighborhood again so so we eliminate the hocus pocus of hey what happened to the hearing oh it got deferred oh okay great you know when the next hearing is no but we'll probably get something in the mail or we'll we'll hear about it and then they take a couple of weeks off or they go away for a vacation they come back and the matter was approved and they're sitting there scratching their head saying well how did that happen like so that has to stop and I think the mechanism is requiring the petitioners themselves uh, to take on that, uh, that burden, if you will, or the expense of just, just notify the neighbors um, when they get the new date. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple stuff. We don't do it. Uh, it's a head scratcher. So that's, that's been a longstanding issue that, that dates back to the 
uh, Menino administration that I think needs to be addressed uh, ASAP. And also, uh, obviously, we want to have a diversity of thought. We want to make sure we're eliminating conflicts, but we also don't want to have a situation where we have so many board members, it's like herding cats because there's an, they play an important role and it's an important function in getting to a decision and getting to consensus is important. And I think having a board that has diversity of thought, but is also very streamlined and focused. And, um, and I've, my experience has been sort of the larger the boards, um, you know, the more complicated and the more hectic. Um, and uh, these decisions need to be made uh, in a relatively uh, short period of time so that uh, uh, the, so that folks can move forward. Um, we want to make sure that we're open for business. We want to encourage investment. We want to keep people working. Uh, we want to move projects forward. Uh, we're a city that uh, continues to be on the move. We boast of the best colleges, universities, uh, network of, of, of hospitals and community health centers uh, where, where CEOs and companies are moving to Boston uh, to tap into the intellectual capital, uh, a livable, workable, safe city. So all of that good mojo is good for Boston. Uh, and a lot of that happens. Uh, I see Commissioner Dion Irish is on here. Um, the volume of traffic that he is seeing over at 1010 Mass Ave, uh, not necessarily a bad thing for Boston, uh, particularly as we're trying to dig out from, from, from the effects of COVID, we need to get things going again. So I just wanna emphasize uh, one, um, you know, new notices need to go out uh, so that you take that appearance of something shady happened uh, and it's a no brainer uh, and put the onus on the petitioner. And also just make sure that we're giving a lot of thought to uh, a board that again has diversity of thought throughout the different sectors, but you really have to streamline it. And I'm on board obviously if we have to, to limit the terms uh, or have folks rotate off like other boards. So I appreciate uh, the time and attention, appreciate all the work you guys do. I, I, I see Ed Colburn's on here, probably one of one of our best uh, um, municipal employees that knows uh, this line of work probably better than anybody uh, along with other uh, dedicated municipal employees. So happy to add my voice, but they're just long-standing issues that uh, that have yet to be addressed. And notice is huge uh, for residents. Uh, you don't have to vote for it against it, but at the very least, you don't want to feel that someone tried to pull one over on you or uh, they deferred and then they snuck it through. And, and that's kind of what happens. And, and uh, if we can eliminate that portion of it and restore a little more confidence and transparency into the process, I think that goes a long way in maybe addressing some of the bigger issues. But uh, I, I, I caution against a, a 13 member or a 15 member or a 21 member board uh, that would, uh, that would, I think that would be uh, a reference like herding cats. So that's it. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I look forward to hearing to some of the responses as to how we're gonna deal with notice uh, on a deferral and uh, sort of what the ultimate number of board members will be. Very well, Councillor Fla Flaherty. Um, and both I think have to do with the home rule petition and for your your opinions, especially about the numbers duly noted, you think 13 is too much. That's correct. What, yeah. We're trying, ask, yeah, we're trying to get to, to, get to you know, from, yeah, I mean, if you think about the issues, Madam Chair, it's like, you know, it's height, it's density, uh, it's uh, transportation studies and uh, traffic. Yeah, um, yeah. It is, um, you know, yes, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get so it's I would I would suggest under 13. Under 13. I think and then, between seven and nine is, is probably appropriate. Seven is would be my preference. Okay. I'm asking as a scrivener. So that's why I'm asking this uh, directly to you. No um, and also would need alternate members in the event of uh, folks yeah. are sick or yeah. on vacation. Very, very well. Um, and I have other questions for my colleagues to answer as well, but um, just to keep going so everyone can, can have his thought. Uh, Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach. Yeah. Hi, hi, Madam Chair. Um, I think my uh, my only question at this point would just be, and I don't know if this was where we were going to go next in the conversation, but I would love to see to hear from the administration sort of what their counter proposal is about seats to add to the ZBA um, and kind of yeah where that that's the main thing I, I wanted to ask yep. about besides what my will, that is absolutely the next step, Council okay. Rock. Absolutely Great. next. That's, step. If that's where we're going, then I I'd like to get there, so I won't I won't ask further questions. Thanks. Okay. Um, I know that there were some questions um, about notice uh, from Councilor Flaherty to the administration specifically on this executive order. And um, if you feel free to answer that, um, I understood that the, the notice and deferrals could be electronic and be, you know, live as the decisions are made, they could be sending out those emails or within 
hours of that, but please, if you can elaborate on the executive order and how they're going to, that's going to change notice commissioner or, or whomever. Yeah, so, so Chris, I'll ask you to take that, but um, I do have a, a follow-up question just so I can understand. Um, um, are we also thinking about deferrals that are caused by not having a, um, you know, a fully seated board? Because like, for example, this past Tuesday, we had about 50% of the cases were deferred because they were, uh, you know, they weren't seven uh, board members sitting. And that's, that's something that's entitled to um, all the applicants when we don't have a fully seated board. So do you also envision that, um, that requirement of having uh, applicants provide notice to a budget in that scenario as well? Um, for, for me and, and for what I think, I actually disagree a little bit from Councillor Flaherty in that, yes, notice is important, but I don't believe the onus should be on any moving party. If the process and the venue is controlled by the city, then the ability for people to have due process should also be controlled by the city. So notice is, I believe, on the city's part. All notice about anything, whatever deferral, whatever the reason for the deferral should be coming from the city. And the subsequent date for when the matter will be deferred to should also be coming from the city. Madam Chair, just some footnote, I, I don't disagree with that. I just want whether it's what cost associated that should be potentially passed on to the petitioner, particularly if they were the ones that recommended the deferral. So I'm in agreement that the city Understood. is is in the best position to notify folks. Yes. And, and, and if the argument against doing that as well, it's costly and postage and everything else, well, then they should pass that through to the petitioner as part of the application process. Correct, but that 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 was my intention. So, so, I, so I think we're I think we're aligned. Very well. So, Commissioner, back to Commissioner Irish. Um, so, so we'll we'll take that under advisement. But, um, Chris, if you could just speak to um what we already have in plan, um, in terms of what notifications we envision being available, um, when we implement the new system. Certainly. So, uh, the goal is to have real time uh, information about each project available on our web, um, with. Uh, hopefully the ability for folks to sign up for information about uh, an individual project or uh, regular notices uh, about hearings in general or geographic location. So, uh, you know, broken down by neighborhood, uh, if you'd like updates on whether or not something's been deferred, approved, uh, et cetera. So we're envisioning the ability to be notified about individual projects as they move through the process as well as uh, summary information following uh, a vote or a decision. And I assume that would also be captured in the quarter or in the quarterly or whatever annual reports of summarizing all the variances given out by the neighborhoods. Absolutely. Very well. Councillor Flaherty, did that answer your question about notice? Councillor Flaherty. He may have uh, had to go. Councillor, oh, I see him. He may, he may be having technical difficulties. Um, very well. I'm going to, unless anyone has any additional questions specifically on the executive order and updates, I do appreciate the updates coming in. Um, we did uh, pause the questioning on the Sullivan Worcester report of the 42 recommendations. Is there any... Um, summary or at least some some response to some of the recommendations that the city has or hasn't responded to in the Sullivan Worcester report? Sure, I can uh, quickly give an update on, on a, you know, if I go through by number, uh, if you'd like. Councillor Wu, is that okay right now? Yes, you're the best, Chris, thank you. Sure, uh, so in section A, um, we are in the planning to add additional meetings quarterly to get through the backlog. Right now we're dealing with the COVID related backlog, um, but we're looking to expand the number of hearings moving forward uh, just so we have an additional night of hearings. Um, on number four, um, we are working with the Groundwater Trust uh, on some updates to the code uh, that will hopefully uh, be in progress in the fall, so September, um, to make changes to the GCOD requirements. Um, in section B, uh, Chris, both, yes. just to stop you very quickly, sure. I apologize. I probably should have, we should reiterate what page we're on. We just went right back to, for those who may just have signed on, 
Um, we're in the Sullivan Worcester report looking at the summary documents or the summary of the 42 recommendations uh, on page, what page is it? I think it's so, uh, page 18. Page 18. Thank you very much. Please continue, I apologize. Sure. Um, section B, uh, the lower threshold for disclosing beneficial interests and the um, limitation on members uh, to have business dealings, both of those were accomplished, by, I think, by the executive order. Um, in section C, um, so right now we're not having meetings uh, in the in hearing room 801. So uh, some of the physical changes there, I think, uh, are somewhat on hold since we're not holding the hearings in public. Um, but I know that the, the sound uh, quality has been worked on in room 801 and they've taken a lot of steps, the property management division to improve that, uh, both the sound and the technology there. Um, the waiting area uh, further down in the hallway, that's item number 11. Um, that is the goal to have that once we start having hearing uh, in person again in the future. Um, section D, uh, digitizing the filing process that is in progress, uh, plan circulation, uh, electronically number 14, that's also in process. Mm -hmm. Uh, number 15, we do have a dedicated it support for ISD. We've hired additional staff and we're expanding our internal it department. Um, number 16, uh, we are communicating pretty much email right now with applicants, but uh, all of our notices are being sent digitally as well as um, hard copy in, in the mail for notices and, and requirements that way. Uh, item number 17 um, is email notice that's provided. Uh, number 18, electronic access to plans for board members in the advance of hearings that is uh, implemented uh, number 19, 20, both of those have been implemented. Number 21, uh, we will uh, move on that uh, once we have in-person hearings again uh, and posting written decisions on the board's website. Uh, that's in progress as well. Under section E, um, I think they trainings that were contemplated in the executive order are in progress, both in ethics and just procedural trainings. So those items um, are all covered by our executive order. In section F, um, we have items 29, 30, 31 have all been completed. Uh, we're posting positions, so those are all in progress, I would say, rather than completed. Um, item number 33 is uh, in progress. So we will be rearranging where uh, the CBA staff sits. Um, moving forward, where there's some changes happening inside 1010 related to uh, animal care uh, and some office reorganization. So that's also in progress. Um, where are we? Items number 34 and 35 are both uh, in progress. Item H, uh, section H, item number 36. Um, I think we we have some work to do there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then section I, um, item number 39 is in process. Uh, item 40 and 41 and 42 are all uh, in process. Thank you. I, I on my informal tally, it looks like the majority of things are either in progress or being implemented. Right. Um, I'll have um, Christine and I will go through the list to make sure we have an understanding of what is outstanding. Sure. Uh, I wanna be clear though, I did not understand that this report was a, re was a requirement or that the administration agreed to all of this. This was an advisory consultant outside report and I, I, I met with the, the two attorneys who helped to write it, and I did not agree with all of their recommendations either. They had also, you know, lowering zoning standards and making sure it was easier to pass things through the ZBA as one of the recommendations. So 
I do appreciate that you've agreed to certain things, but I do think it's important as you are going to agree or disagree with anything in this report that has not been publicly, you know, back and forth and vetted, uh, the administration be very open about that. And I appreciate Councillor Wu asking these questions so we can see. Certainly. Councillor Edwards, just to your point, um, you're correct. Uh, this was not a report that uh, blanket, uh, it was accepted a lot of the uh, things, I think it was uh, raised at the last hearing, uh, are things that really require broader conversations, including with the community. Um, and that's, so you're, you're correct in that, in that understanding. And I would add, like one such item is the uh, removing G card from the Board of Appeal process. Um, there's arguments on both sides that it, it's, it's good for transparency to have it as a part of the, the uh, Board of Appeal process. And some may argue that it takes up time on the agenda. So there, that's just one example. Also, the report also conflicts with some of the recommendations from my home rule petition. So I don't agree with some parts as well. Mm -hmm. They don't agree with me either. So in any no, event, um, in any event, uh, again, I, I want to thank Councillor Wu for bringing that up. I didn't think to go through that number, and I appreciate that, Councillor Wu. Um, just finally, before we go to the actual ZBA or to the home rule petition, the trainings will also involve any updates for on cannabis regulations as well for the ZBA. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's all. I wanted to make sure that was part of the, the trainings. Sure. Um, all right. So now going into the heart of the matter, the um, proposed zoning um, home rule petition and the three buckets where I find where there is either no opinion or there's or there's no that are specifically not addressed by the executive order is the board composition, the standard for a variance and term limits. So I don't know what the administration would like to do in terms of responding uh, to to any of those things or recommendations that the board has or excuse me, that the administration has. I'll jump in here. I just want to reiterate that I, I view this in, in my, my mindset for this particular um, discussion today is that this is a working session. So Correct. Um, I, I would say with respect to um, the, the positions, um, we do feel strongly that there is a need for architect position on the board, um, but we, we do agree that I, I think there, it would be an added benefit to have a position that has a city planning perspective and also an environmental perspective. Okay. Do you do you have any thoughts about removal of any of the board current positions at all? You want to take that? Think, sure. I think our position on that, uh, Councillor, and I think we discussed this prior, is you know whatever we send up to the legislature, we really want to position it for success. Right. Uh, we do feel that there's a need for technical expertise on the board. Uh, and that uh, a lot of those slots that currently uh, occupy uh, still have value. Um, and uh, again, to not invite uh, unnecessary opposition, we feel like we can get to a better place by adding uh, additional expertise to the board uh, along the lines that uh, Commissioner Irish just described. Was there any thought about having somebody who is a zoning law expert or I had renter's perspective or homeowner perspective? Um, there's lots of different perspectives there. And I, I, I'm very, first of all, great. We agree on at least uh, two perspectives that certainly should be part of the board. So that's good. We environmentalists and city planner. Um, but was um, any thoughts to that? And then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues to talk about the composition of the board and any questions they have. Yeah, definitely the thoughts about it. There's, you know, a, a lot of different perspectives that we need to have on the board and, and different ways to accomplish having those lenses, whether it's, it's through policy or through people who are actually sitting on the board. But right. we also um, believe that the board shouldn't be un unwieldy. We need to have, a, it's, you know, a, a, maybe if we added a position or two, we think that that would be sort of the max of what the board would look like. So, you mm -hmm. know, prioritizing what we thought would be most beneficial, we are in agreement on those two positions. So you see the board expanding to nine? Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I would not, I'm not here to make that no, to we're here to have that two, conversation. Yeah. Two positions, it would take the board to a maximum of nine? Yes. Okay. To my colleagues, in order of arrival, um, Councillor, I think Flynn may not be here, but um, Councillor Wu? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, everyone. I just need to hop off, but wanted to say thank you, especially to Chris, for making that happen on, on a quick turnaround. I really appreciate it. 
Thank you, Councillor Wu. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Braden. Um, I really hear the the, the um, concerns about making the the board too large, but um, I think diversifying the expertise is really important. Um, the existing board is is pretty heavy on on uh, labour representation, which I I absolutely support labour representation, but maybe um, if we're if we're limited in the actual number of, of places, we may have to do a little. Uh, adjustment there, um, and I'm not. Um, I don't have a vested interest. I think having a homeowner or community um, uh, affordable housing um, expertise would be really helpful. Very well. Um, is that it on just the composition, Councillor Braden? Um, I agree with this, the term limits. I think uh, up to three terms would be would be good. Um, I'm, I, I would like to know more about the standard for variance because um, the, the issue of variances is huge out here. We have some projects that are just asking for so many variances and uh, that are getting granted. And I, I just really am trying to get my head around what's the standard um, and, and figure out if we need to do more intervention to get a handle on that in a different forum from this. Thank you. Very well, I understand. Um, Councillor, Councillor Sabi George. No, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions at this point. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. You're still with yeah. us? No, yeah, just to just to reaffirm. Obviously, diversity of thought in in in, in um, acumen and specialty is important, but uh, obviously, it, uh, we got to come to decisions on important matters. And, and I think the the larger the board, the harder it would be to manage. And the harder it would be to come to consensus, uh, and, it, and they play a critical function uh, in our city. So uh, I want to be able to balance, um, you know, having sort of a uh, a, a wide um, selection of, of occupations and, and personal and professional experience, but also need to caution against uh, having an unwielding board that is like herding cats. So striking that balance uh, is important, and obviously just the uh, initial point I made that uh, notice is important to. To, uh, to direct about is and to community folks so that they don't feel that um, the cake was baked. But other than that, um, appreciate the time and everyone's work on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Be uh, gonna, before you go, Councillor Flaherty, I did have, and I have, it looks like uh, yes. Attorney John does as well have a question, but I wanted to ask what your thoughts were about the two proposed um, positions from the administration, a city planner and environmentalist. Did you think there was another or any other perspective you think should be as required in this? Um, home rule. Um, give that. I can give it a little more thought. Um, okay. We obviously we have I think someone with um, uh, sort of architectural engineering. I mean, I mean, you think about what happens when they submit the when they submit the plans. Um, we clearly need uh, you know an architect or structural engineer to to review the plans and to advise uh, fellow members of the board. Uh, there's a legal piece of it. Uh, there's clearly a, a real estate and a, and a housing piece to it. Um, you obviously want community voice on there. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the, the great efforts that uh, this administration and, and us uh, as a body are doing around climate resiliency, um, that's clearly a big piece. And, and I think Councilor Flynn, I know he's, he's not on, but uh, he's in all the projects that we've been working on together, it's, uh, it's about uh, transportation and, uh, and, and uh, around, uh, you know, pedestrian safety and uh, that type of stuff. So having someone that has uh, a background in the environment and, and transportation is, is critical, I think, to the things that we're seeing on a regular basis. So, yeah, so I'd be open to a number of different uh, uh, sectors. Um, attorney, attorney Tao. Uh, John, uh, toll Councillor Edwards, that's okay. Oh, the, uh, <laughs> don't worry about Fine, it. John, how are you? How are you, Councillor? Uh, I just want to speak to that point, Councillor. You know, we, we we have tried to give a lot of thought to what the uh, finding that appropriate balance in terms of just the size of the board, um, so that it doesn't become unwieldy. That we do uh, permit enough voices, uh, recognizing that this is a board that, that by design welcomes all public input. Um, we do. You want to have uh, that expertise reflected. Uh, so we're really, you know, we're thinking about that hard, uh, and we're happy working with all of you on that. Um, but the additional benefit of expanding it um, is just the efficiency of the board. 
uh, as the commissioner and, uh, and Chris English have laid out, uh, we do have a backlog of cases um, uh, for pre-COVID and now the COVID cases. Uh, it's a lot of work and uh, be, being able to see a quorum uh, and avoid uh, delays and, and uh, putting things off uh, would be a huge benefit. So just from a practical standpoint, I just want to make that point, but thank you. Very good. Thank good talk you. To you um, Councillor Bach. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just wondering, uh, so I would say I certainly, um, I certainly would support the addition of both an environmentalist voice and an urban planning voice um, on the board. Um, I do want to flag, and I know this has come up in some of our discussion today and in the past, that it seems to me that the more you have competent experts on your board bringing their expertise, the more important it is that the board have the documents related to the cases sufficiently in advance that they can actually use that expertise and the public can benefit from it. Um, I know Councillor Flaherty was just referencing the need for, um, you know, for the board to be a manageable side in order to have those conversations and reach consensus. But it also seems like, you know, based on a number of things I've seen in reports, I've heard that sometimes the board is, uh, is adjudicating matters that there's been relatively little uh, prior um, preparatory time for board members for. Um, and I just wanna flag that because I think, I think we just have to recognize that like the point of adding expertise is to have that expertise then actually be used in this process, right? So that that seems to me pretty critical. Um, but I think I think those are two good additions. Um, I mean, I also like Councillor Edwards would be interested in someone with a kind of housing perspective, um, mm -hmm. and specifically a sort of affordability, fair housing perspective, um, because it's such a critical issue in the city. And I think what we're trying to do with the fair housing zoning amendment is to look at structural ways to just build those considerations in more. Um, and so. Uh, I do, I do think um, something along those lines would be good. I was wondering, um, and and this is, uh, I don't know if um, uh, Commissioner Irish or, or Chris or anyone can just fill me in a little bit on. We currently have. Um, I know you were. I know you gave Councillor Wu the sort of current appointments. Um, I was confused because when I looked at kind of past legislation. Uh, what I thought was the Enabling Act, it was for 11 commissioners. And I'm just trying to understand what the current formal number in the Enabling Act is. And Councilor Edwards might know this answer too. Um, so right now, the statutory Enabling Act has seven members plus seven alternates. So each category of appointee has a full member and an alternate. So in theory, it would be a total of 14 appointees. Um, but right now it's, you know, between alternates and active members, we have six. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah, that's helpful. I guess I was looking at an old version then. Um, do you know when we last amended the Enabling Act? Um, I do. Let's see. The, I, I believe it was in 1993. Uh, was the last time there was substantial changes made to um, the enabling legislation. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's strange. I'll have to, well, no, it's fine. I've got a version that I thought was up through 2001 that has 11. That's, that's what I have too, Councilor. Yeah, I think, I think perhaps it's not 14 because maybe there aren't alternates for the mayor's at large appointments or something. Is that, I think I know, but yeah. Um, Anyways, um, yeah, so, but I don't want to do, I, I, although a working session is good to work, I don't need, I, need, I don't need folks to wait for me to read through uh, this right now. But um, yeah, just would love to, um, I would love to make sure that um, we're really considering the possibility of adding somebody with that housing expertise into the mix as well. Um, that, that strikes me as important. Um, and so, and I don't know whether, and I, and I also think just maybe um, for me, what I have to do a little bit more homework on, and obviously this is a, I'm uh, new to the weeds of this issue is just the, the considerations that um, the mayor takes into, into account in appointing the at-large members and whether there's a space there for the conversation about sort of renters and homeowners and such. I was thinking that too. Yeah. Cause that yeah. seems like another place to kind of, you know, where you could, you could be considering a bunch of factors, but that could be one of them. And we, yeah, 
So, right. um, so forgive me for not, not coming with an iron type proposal on that front, but that's sort of where my thinking is, is I think the two proposed by the administration are great. Um, in line with Councillor Edwards' proposal, I think we should keep talking about the possibility of adding some housing expertise. And I think looking at sort of um, renter and homeownership identity in connection to the mayor's at-large um, spots might make sense. So I'll leave uh, my comments there, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go back to ask the administration some thoughts about maybe some compromise or approach to this um, in terms of the position. So we uh, very likely will not agree on the exact positioning at this point. And I've actually, I got an excellent letter I wanna say from a woman from Rosendale, I can't remember, Christine sent it out. Uh, it was a really good letter, but a lot of what she was noting is that these conversations, especially about the positions, um, she would want more robust conversation in the community level about these positions. And I, I, I respect that. Um, so what uh, uh, um, a compromise that might be worth that, allowing for continued conversation, but also allowing for us to move this forward is to look at the two that are proposed by the administration, but also to look at language within the home rule petition that allows for Boston to add the seats on its own going forward. By that, I mean, I mean, any opportunity to stop having the state house, <laughs> having to go back to the state house to make an amendment on certain components of our laws, I think is a good thing. We're doing it with linkage, for example, right? Where we're essentially asking for us to be able to make the decision on our own. And I think it would make sense going forward, um, we can continue this conversation if we could pass this with kind of the compromise positions that we can work on. And I, I, you know, I still would like a third, but we can work on what that compromise is, but allow for uh, legislation that uh, kind of allows for Boston to continue this conversation. Because I do believe how we grow, how we look, um, how we build changes and it shouldn't, and unfortunately, in order to get a home will petition to, to adjust for that change every single time is not, not realistic. But I do think we should be at least able to have that conversation begin and end that conversation in Boston. So I can work on the language. I don't have it right now. But if we were, to, if that's a proposal that makes sense to the administration, basically go with what we can agree on now, keep the seats now, but allow for Boston the city, city council, the mayor, the community to decide at a later date what additional seats or what seats are or are no, no longer necessary. You, Councillor, can I ask for clarification? Are you talking about with the legislature that Boston would be able to redefine the categories uh, that are currently in? Or are you talking about going from nine to Boston retaining the authority to go to 11, for example? I'm talking about Boston being able to de define who is on the ZBA for Boston in whatever format, the number and the positions and perspectives that will be brought and asking for that final permission from the state house in this, um, in this act as a compromise. And I, I, I just think, you know, maybe it's the, you know, the city council and me and it's it, you you kind of it, it's exhausting sometimes to always have to ask folks who who don't live in Boston and don't some don't even represent parts of Boston about what their thoughts are about how we're going to build here. And I think that there's a compromise language that we put in kind of a hook to allow for us uh, essentially kind of a, an enabling um, local option, if you will, for us to be able to define how the ZBA looks and that's all it can do it won't give us out you know we would still have to come up with the whole process for that we would still have to come up with something that is i think constitutional allows for due process and allows for a, the proper pushback that it needs to but that we may not have to go back is is my thought i thought that was a compromise because there are a lot more positions that i think about right now right um, and you may, uh, the administration may just disagree. So I, I think we'll, we move with what we can agree on and then allow for a real honest open debate in Boston for Boston. That's my thought. This is, I mean, obviously it's a, it's the first time hearing of it. I, I you know, from the very beginning council, I've, I've really enjoyed working with you and I enjoy the fact that you're always trying to find a way forward. Uh, I, I really respect that a lot. 
Um, it's it's something that obviously, I mean, if you're going to, you know, we'll, we'll we'll look at that and consider it. Uh, I, I don't know what that looks like, and I would have to really sit down and take some time to think about that uh, and what that would mean. Uh, I know the one thing, uh, as I've said before, and I'll, I don't want to mean to sound like a broken record, but the mayor really wants to send something to the state house that he feels going to have a solid chance of passing. Um, so, like I said, um, let us take that back, and but let's have that conversation. But I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, to my to my uh, to my colleagues, can uh, Councillor Ba, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Braden, what are your thoughts about that kind of compromise? A point where we may not come to complete agreement right now, but wouldn't it be nice that it? <laughs> when we do and when we have it, it's in Boston and Boston can just make the decisions going forward. That's the goal, kind of like what we do with linkage. If it passes, we'll be able to turn it up or turn it down based on our studied understanding of what needs to happen in our development. So that's to my colleagues. I'm trying not to let perfect be the enemy of the good. I'm not going to agree with certain things right now. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there, but I do do believe process and the ability for us to control our future is important. I see Councilor Braden has her hand raised. I, I agree. I, I feel that having that capacity to uh, be able to change the confirmation of the uh, the structure of the, the board to, to meet the needs that we have in Boston without having to go cap in hand to ask the state to help ch to change things is very important. Um, I, I, I'm just getting to appreciate the frustration of, of this process of having to do the home rule process. It mm -hmm. is really frustrating. Like we're we're like adolescents who need to go to Papa to get permission to do things. It's really <laughs> crazy. But yeah, um, so I appreciate that. And and you know, I really feel that adding um, some more 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 breadth and to the to the board itself is really important. Um, you know, I, I think the two suggestions from the administration, the city planner, and the uh, environmental uh, representation would be really addition uh, would really add to it. But I think the housing, someone with a, a fair housing or um, with housing background, uh, from the point of view of just trying to advocate and and push for housing, I think it brings that that really important perspective to the board as well. If we can get that on, thank you, yeah. Councillor um, Asabi George. In order, if you have any thoughts and. No, I agree with that sentiment. I think that that is um, a really good approach for us to take. Thank you. Councillor Bach? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm strongly in favor of us taking as much control of our internal city operations from the state house as possible, always. Um, I think that politically, uh, to um, the administration's point, I think that if we tried to send a home rule up that gave us carte blanche to change it from this point forward, some of the same interests that would object to us removing seats will object to the possibility of us removing those seats um, through that carte blanche. So I would think that in order to uh, pass something through, we might have to do something like we give ourselves the right to define up to this number of extra seats like with you know, where we're, we're leaving the categories open, but we're explicitly not taking the capacity to remove seats from sort of existing interests on the board. I mean, that's just my political like analysis right off, but it's just off the bat, you know, I think again, something to discuss. Um, I did want to flag while I was sitting here, I looked at, I did do a little more reading and it seems like even in the existing statute. So for instance, um, there are three people appointed by the mayor at large and it said and there's these the, and it says okay he appoints three people at large at least one of them needs to be an owner occupant of like a small dwelling and at least one of them has to be a um a small business owner of a of a business that's uh, that has 50 or fewer employees and then but it doesn't actually have any condition like that for the sort of third hypothetical at large so it seems to me really low hanging fruit would be to say one of the the last third at large person should rent um, and it seems like it's in a similar category as those other two requirements, the owner occupant and the small business owner. Um, and then I just was curious, um, and this is a clarification question and forgive me if I, um, didn't understand this before, but I, could the administration clarify, do we have these three neighborhood organization 
commissioners on the commission at the moment? We have two, don't we? We have Joe Ruggiero is one. Right, okay. Uh, Ed DeVoe would be, um, no, actually. Oh, with two vacant alternate uh, positions for the neighborhood organization representatives. So, and, and allow me to ask just a clarifying question about that. So when you say alternates, like the, the statute provides for a commission of 11 zoning commissioners and it doesn't say anything about. So, so the, the, the difference between the zoning commission and the zoning board of appeal. Right. Oh, that's right. Right. That's right. 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 Yep. That's right. So the okay. board of appeal has seven full members and seven that's, alternates. So, so then that's, so then that's my confusion, right? As I'm looking at the, oh. those, those at large selections are for the commission, not the board of appeal. That makes sense. Oh, okay. I mean, it makes sense. We should probably change it, but um, but it is how it is. Um, okay, cool. I will. I'll do more reading in advance. But yeah, I would just say that uh, I definitely. I, I I think the idea from Councilor Edwards of moving forward with what we agree on and and seeing what wiggle room we could provide ourselves for further changes later without going back with a home rule would make sense. But I think we probably have to tailor that wiggle room if we want to actually send something up that we can get through. So those would be my comments. Thanks, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. So, um, and it will, we can work on what that language looks like. I think you are, oh, Councilor Braden, you raised your hand again. You're on mute. In terms of public perception, when you look go on the website and you look at the board, um, it's, it'd be really important to uh, tag what the bio and the affiliation of the different and the expertise of the different members of the board so that they could members of the public could say oh he he's a he this guy's a um, an architect or a da -da, you know so that you have a better a city planner or whatever the whatever their designation or their expertise is so that you get a better understanding of of the the the, the actual um the range of, of, of expertise on the board from the public perspective, perspective, it might be a way to increase confidence in, in, in their decision-making if we knew who they were. If you're an outsider, you don't know who they are. So just right. people on the board, yeah. I agree with that. I think that's a technical thing. We don't, we don't need to put it in the home rule petition. Is that something the administration would be willing to do? Absolutely, I think we can do that administratively. It's a bio section, basically, so we understand what perspective, how we're complying with the zoning or with the, with, the, with the law. I think that's good. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Um, so moving on to the next big section where I think uh, we also are balancing, um, trying to respond to how variances are given out. Also balancing with uh, that there is not agreement on changing the standard for a variance. It'd be very uh, transparent to my colleagues and also trying to get something passed at the state house so i'll just start with um this might be and and i did get in and being totally transparent we got an email today a very comprehensive email saying if you're going to touch the standard for variance and make it part of the zoning code that should be a prolonged longer public conversation i think my colleagues got that email from the woman from rosendale Right. And that was one of her um, her thoughts. And I, I don't disagree with her. Um, so my I'll just put it out here again. Is this maybe another opportunity for us to be able to, again, discuss at some point, um, put in something placeholder language saying that the current standard is X. Boston at a later date. May consider. Through an, a, a blank, blank, blank process changing the variant standard so that so that we're not stuck on I we just we just I mean I'm putting out to my colleagues this is not a like a contentious disagreement we just I mean it's a lot of stuff I'm asking to be considered for the variance and I'm I, I think it's important to consider all things impacts on the the city planning goals this packs on affirmatively furthering for housing all of these different things I think should be part of the conversation now the good thing is my understanding we can make those parts of the conversation by who's on the board but also by um the way the public has testimony and thoughts and concerns. You, we can make conversation, okay? How, how which a project is judged is what I'm also trying to change. And so um, again, if, if we're talking about 
uh, perfection not being the enemy of the good and perfection not being the enemy of progress to get something up there, might it make sense to have that compromise language? This is my question to the administration and to my colleagues, if that makes sense. It, 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 just know it kills me <laughs> to the thought of that. I'm sick. It kills me. I'm dying a little inside, but I am also trying to get something uh, done. So just know that it's painful. I'm sorry. I, I would love to just chime in and say, you know, the detailed standards for granting of a variance are itemized out in the zoning code, which we don't need state legislation to change. Um, and we can do that through a process with the zoning commission. Um, okay. So I think it's section 7C in the zoning code that details those standards. Um, that's something that can be done um, through a zoning commission process rather than having to go to the legislature for it. But is the granting of a variance part of the zoning code? So the, I think in- Cause I don't think that that's, that's the issue, right? It's, it's, we can, what we consider, right? For granting zoning is one thing, but when the person's saying I want an exception to that rule, I don't believe that that's part of the zoning code. Maybe I'm wrong. I, th I think the the board, the ZBA, they're empowered to grant variances to the zoning code. So that's how itemized in the statute. And then the regulation of what they use to consider the granting of a variance is listed in, in the zoning code, which would more, rather than you look at it like the uh, the ability to grant the variances is the law. The standards they use to grant those variants are the regulation. And that's in 7C? I believe so. We can bring that up. Um, I'm wondering if someone can get 7C over to us for this working session. We have, a, I'm trying to keep us to about two hours. So if we can get 7C and make sure we're clear about where the variance standards are. I understood, my understanding is it was a substantial hardship and looking at the topography, there's like four things that they're supposed to say. And you're saying those four things are already in the zoning code. Uh, yep, S section 7C, conditions required for a variance. Is that? Uh, Subsection A, uh, special circumstances or conditions, uh, but including but not limited to exceptional narrowness, shallowness, shape of lot, exceptional topographical, topographical conditions, etc. Uh, reasons of practical difficulty and substantial hardship. Uh, granting of a variance to be in harmony with general purpose and intent of the code, and. Um, a specific uh, itemized number for development impact projects. So those are in the in the zoning code rather than in the statute, uh, as I read it. Okay. Um, section eighty B seven. This is not under Article eighty. The no, Article seven. Seven. Sorry. I, I, Call it section seven dash three, but it's article seven, section seven three. Does everyone have this? Does anyone need this in front of them? I think it would be helpful, yes, if, if we could send it. Um or where I might find it. <laughs> I have a link, I'll forward it to you and um, I just sent I just sent a link to the whole the email I, chain, Christine. Excellent. All right, so I pulled up Article 7. Variances, authorization under the acts, procedural for appeal, that's, that's how. So, so the BPDA basically submits within 30 days after the transmittal of a, whatever, the report to the ZBA, looking at all of these standards and whether they should be granting a variance or not. Am I correct, Chris? 
Right. So there's there's two aspects of it. One is the procedure, and that's what the board, uh, the BPDA uses to make their recommendations. Mm -hmm. And then in section 7-3, it's the Board of Appeals should grant a variance only if it finds that the following conditions are met. So those are what they use to, to grant the actual variance. Their authority to grant the variances, I think, is, is defined in the statute, in the statute but not the standard for them, which is here. Right. So I'll just note for some of my colleagues, I don't see financial hardship being one of them. And I will say that that's been one of the biggest frustrations yeah. is that that is used by a lot of developers and folks that it's just, it can't make the numbers work as a quote. And so this one, this is great. So I, I'm the, it, the, the issue I think is, is mute in terms of this home rule petition. I think we still need to look at this standard and we can probably through another process now look at that standard. I, I think my colleagues agree on that. Am I correct, Ken, Kenzie? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's one thing, but two, um, if this is the standard, I don't hear anybody on the ZBA ask these kinds of questions. I don't see it. Um, and that might be a lot of having to do with the training that they need to have, the time that they need to have to review, right? And also in general, I think we need to talk about more of the, the standards in general that, that come into this. But this is extremely helpful. Thank you, Chris. This was great. Or attorneys, maybe whoever, or commissioner, whoever um, just you know, said this. But I, I do hope that there is a commitment also to re review these standards. I'm seeing 1970 in here um, as maybe the last time the standards may have been amended or either way, I think it's worthy of a 2020 vision, don't you? Certainly. Um, can Councilor Bach, you raised your hand. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, I, I agree. I think that there's a good, I think that the conversation about the standard for variance is one that um, that is at the heart of a lot of folks' frustration around the city um, on all sides, right? About predictability and expectations. Um, and to Councilor Edwards' point, I think that reforming it would be something that would involve a real public conversation. Um, but it's good to know that that conversation is is perhaps more in our hands than we thought vis-a-vis -vis the question of, you know, what goes up to the state and what doesn't. Um, I just wanted to flag quickly uh, on the back on the sort of composition of the board point um, before we wrapped up having having had a little bit more time to catch up now. Um, just that I would I would appreciate if the administration would consider the question of I mean, obviously for a board like this, you wanna have an odd number of people um, for you know decision-making purposes. And so I wonder if in addition to the environmentalist and the urban planner, we could think about whether the administration would be open to adding somebody with housing expertise as the fifth person in place of the at-large seat, um, since that's the one existing seat that doesn't, um, that doesn't, isn't, isn't, sort of doesn't, isn't pulled from, uh, a, a particular constituency at the moment. Um, just, I think that would be a good good conversation point for us. And then I wonder if we could talk about, you know, we have these two residential neighborhood organization members, whether it could make sense to say at any given time, you know, one of them needs to be a owner occupant and one of them needs to be a renter, or if that's too exclusive, right? Whether we're saying something like, hey, we've got all these different appointed, you know, people, but, at least somebody on the board needs to be a renter. And I, I just, I'm, I'd be interested in sort of thinking through how we could graph something like that on here. So um, those are just my two other comments on the board composition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Attorney. Council, we'll actually, I will absolutely take those under consideration. Absolutely, we'll think about those. And just for the, re for the record, Council Edwards, I'm not an attorney. I just play one on TV every really? once in a while. <laughs> I thought, oh, my apologies. It looks like one. <laughs> well, last, well, last hearing, I made everyone a counselor. Everyone became a, a city counselor. I just uh, added that to their title. So um, uh, my apologies. Okay. <laughs> um, there, um, so the, the, the third part, the third part, um, if we can, now that I think we've resolved the, the conditions for the variance, that's a different conversation. We're thinking about some compromise language for the um, composition of the board to move it. The third part was about term limits. 
And I don't know uh, if, if this is the appropriate venue for that, the home rule petition, or if there's another way to do it. But I do think it's worthy of the conversation of how many times the person can be reappointed to the board. You know, I think at the last hearing, uh, this was raised, um, and I think we indicated that the mayor is absolutely open to that uh, conversation. Uh, it did not, it's funny because as much as I keep talking about, you know, if, if we can take things in our own hands and position this bill for success at the state house, that's how we should do it. Uh, the idea that this could be accomplished through uh, either executive order, um, that's, that's something that uh, until you raised it, it hadn't really occurred. So I'd like an opportunity to go back and kind of look at that. You know, I will say, um, yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, this is something we're going to look at and we'll move on a fast. Do we have an agreement for what the term limits could be? I, I was saying no more than three. Um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know on that. I would have to go back uh, and talk with some other folks and find out what they would stand on that. Uh, and I also want to be, you know, I want to, you know, just be very transparent with, you know, we have a backlog right now. We do think experience counts. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, how we structure this uh, so that we're not just jettisoning all the experience. Uh, so we, we want to, however, if, if, for example, the mayor is, is open to term limits, uh, that this is done in a, in a rational way. Like I said, we'll go back and we'll take a look at that. Um, I don't know where the terms, even the three-year terms are provided for. Maybe that would help us in understanding which um, which appropriate vehicles, the one that needs to be amended. Um, I don't know if it's in the home rule or in the current law right now that it's a three-year term or was that uh, created by the administration? Term is set by statute, um, but the statute does not speak to number of terms that somebody can serve. It's silent so it looks on like that. the statute would need to be amended. Potentially. I'm not quite sure. And I'd like to talk to some lawyers about that. It may be within our reach that we just do it ourselves. Um, so, but like I said, let's, uh, I'd like to have some conversation with our, with our uh, corporation council and some other folks and um, see what we can take into our own hands there and see what's doable. Okay. I appreciate the work on, on this, uh, the back and forth and the executive order as well. My, my, my other question would be a matter of practicality. Um, and this is, you again can correct me on the effectiveness of an executive order. I understand that they're as effective as the executive and how they're enforced by that executive. But if this, you know, if we have a new administration or 10 years from now, the executive order from the Walsh administration, is it only as good as when the Walsh administration is in, in power to enforce it? Yeah. Or does it bind other ones? Because if it, if it is only limited to the current administration, then why wouldn't we make this a statute so it's permanent? The things we agree on even. I, I, don't, I don't know technically the answer to that, how long and binding the mayor's executive order is. I don't know the answer to that counselor. Okay, I, I, I will, Christine and I, that's a uh, city council counselor, attorney for the city council, and I can go through the analysis of the, you know, the enforcement, because, you know, when I think about, I think about the now, but I also think about what we're, what we're binding people to in the future. And I don't want hard work now to be just for this moment and this time, you know, 10 years from now to be totally undone. So this is not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. It's a matter of how do we make sure this is permanent? I, I would just like to add that, you know, uh, in general, um, the analysis is that changing a statute is a very high bar. It's a, it's a heavy lift. So if, if we can accomplish the goals in other ways without doing that, then we always do that in the analysis of general. Agreed. Um, and I think that it helps immediately with the acute pain of a lot of people and their concerns right now. Um, but my, my, my question is, is more like how do we make sure this is permanent? And if, if it requires a statute to make it permanent or not. Um, so I, I will check in with Christine about that or not. I would hope that everything we agree on could be in a statute if necessary to make it permanent. Only the stuff we agree on. 
So that's where my headspace is now. The final product, what it needs to look like to make sure this is done. Um, so um, 11.56, I'm under my two hour. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's lunchtime for a lot of folks. And I want to thank Councilor Graydon and Councilor Bach, um, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Flaherty and Councilor Flynn who joined us today. Um, I don't have any, um, well, I'll, I will give some update conclusory remarks, but I'll turn it over to Cal oh, Councilor, um, Commissioner Iris, you raised your hand. Yes, one more point. I, I would invite everyone to take a look at um, uh, Board of Appeal hearings, particularly the last several weeks of hearings. Um, you will see some thoughtful um, discussion. The standards that we mentioned um, prior, you will see the, that they reference standards quite often in making decisions. Um, now that they have an, a more manageable agenda, I think we're there accomplishing that. So uh, I would just put it, leave it there without being, I'm not trying to be defensive, but I do think that if you looked at some of those hearings that you would see that, that the board does a pretty good job of um, applying standards when they're making decisions. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and I do think it's, it's, you know, anything that we're trying to change, we should at least be watching to see how it's functioning. Completely agree. Um, so Councillor Braden, if you have any conclusory remarks and then Councillor Bach. Thank you so much. This has been really, um, really helpful to um, pull this all together and, and a good forum to discuss the practicalities of change that we might be able to, to um, move forward. Um, I do want to echo Councillor um, Edwards' um, comment about financial hardship that is so so often one of the um, one of the reasons that a developer will come forward um, and ask for a push for a variance and it really is should not even be entertained as a as an excuse for asking for a variance uh, there's so many other issues that at stake and uh, if they have over ex overextended themselves in purchasing a property speculatively we should not be held we should not be asked to uh, accommodate that that's their problem Thank you. 100% agree. agree. Uh, Councillor Bach? Just wanted to thank you, Madam Chair, for convening this and for your leadership on the issue and to um, I ISD for all, all the work that you're doing um, on the ZDA reforms and uh, and your partnership with the council on, on this. I think, I really think that adding those seats that we discussed would make a, a lot of sense. And um, and especially especially if we really create the opportunity for the members of the ZBA to bring their expertise to bear on these issues um, could really, you know, that along with some of the other reforms could go a long way to kind of establishing a track record that gave the public greater confidence um, in the board. And I think, I think that that we just have to remember that that's a really important goal um, in this whole process is for people, you want people um, to feel like they can, they have reasonable legitimate expectations vis-a-vis -vis consistency and transparency for government processes like these um, and that they can, uh, you know, see public servants like transparently um, working on their behalf. And I think uh, that's, that's where we've got to be trying to get. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, so I'll just conclude by saying uh, what I started out with at the very beginning. I expect to have a finished product for our, um, for our vote. By that, I mean the city council's vote on July 29th. And so in this time, um, hearing the feedback, excuse me, and, and hearing uh, back from my colleagues, it seems that um, there is consensus around a compromise um, on the positions, but making sure that it go gets to the state house. Um, there is an interest in allowing for us to continue conversation on our own with some sort of empowerment on this composition of the ZBA. Term limits are absolutely something we're interested in. We will follow up to determine in what vehicle is best to implement those term limits. Uh, this is something that, that the council and the administration are in agreement on, that they are necessary. The question is where do we put them? I think I've summarized. And then also with regards to the standard for variance, it will be um, through a public prolonged process uh, that is looking at section seven. Um, and uh, looking at the conditions required for a variance going forward. Um, I want people to know there's been significant work and significant change um, for how we do business at the ZBA, which as a district city councilor, 
Um, note, the district city councilors are the only ones left on, the <laughs> on this call. And it's because probably we get the most calls about zoning. We absolutely do. And, um, and this, the, the process in the ZBA was in much needed, uh, was in much need of, of, of improvement, of inclusion. Uh, I noted it was, it was borderline shameful that it was only in English knowing the diversity of our communities. Um, and there has been a re immediate response to that from the administration as early as February this year. I think I reintroduced this in January to have it executive order done by February is a, is a direct response to some of the most pressing needs and concerns. So I do thank you for that. I do thank you for that. Um, we, uh, where we disagree is, is become quite narrow. It's a matter of perspective. And I, again, I acknowledge that. Um, and so I think we will be able to get something done and out to the state house on the 29th. Um, thank you so much for your participation. Um, thank you so much for your um, quick response and research. Um, this is to Commissioner Irish, to uh, Chris, to John. And I think Ed was here the entire time and I know he took a lot of notes. <laughs> yes, so, I did, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So if there's, we will have some follow up uh, specifically around the compromise language that we think we can live with. I think we need to do that. And then, um, and then the term limits would probably be the last two things to, to adjust. And that will be it. So thank you very much. Have a good day. 1202. 1202. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.